So, um, so this uh, webinar series is focused on opportunities to better design monitoring and modeling initiatives to meet applied science needs. And this, uh, uh, and if those well, of you who uh, are in that was something your else, but this is the main call I needed to take part in today. That's hey, going everyone. well. Just letting you know, some people are not on mute, so please no, go ahead. Okay. Bottom yeah, left just... part of the screen. Thanks. So this um, series of webinars is co-hosted by several IARPIC collaboration teams, including the Marine Ecosystems, Environmental Intelligence, Coastal Resilience, and Sea Ice collaboration teams, as well as the Arctic Observing and Modeling subgroups of the Environmental Intelligence team. Next slide, please. So uh, we're hosting this webinar during the normal uh, monthly meeting time for the Marine Ecosystems collaboration team. So uh, much of our um, discussion may seem a little bit marine um, focused today, although uh, this is co-hosted by several different teams. Um, so um, speaking, especially from a marine ecosystem science perspective, uh, we all recognize that science is expensive. And those of us working in marine ecosystems often need to charter vessels like the one pictured here to, to um, even get to our study site. So we recognize that there are limited opportunities for observations, and we wanna try to maximize the use of the information that we collect. And so we don't wanna miss opportunities to address applied uh, science needs using basic science. And we don't want to miss our opportunities to improve models using the uh, observations that we're collecting either. Next slide, please. So what role can IARPIC collaborations play here? IARPIC collaborations attracts the participation of individuals who work in a broad range of scientific disciplines from the physical sciences to biological and social sciences, but it also attracts the participation of individuals with a broad range of interest in scientific information from those working in resource management agencies, to academic scientists and Alaska community members. So IARPIC collaborations is well positioned to facilitate communication among these groups to allow the type of cooperation necessary to achieve the goals stated on my last slide. I recognize that each of the three stakeholder groups illustrated here have needs for many different types of information and need that information at a variety of timescales. But for the sake of just introducing this discussion, I'm going to make some generalizations that oversimplify the needs of each group. We'll begin with resource management agencies. Managers may seek information that indicates if the trend in the abundance of the resource they're managing is increasing, decreasing, or remaining stable so they can set annual harvest quotas, for example. They often need this information on the timescale of months. Alaska communities may be most interested in scientific information that res relates to public safety and food security. For example, is the sea ice stable enough or are the weather conditions safe enough for me to take my nephew hunting? Am I likely to find the subsistence resources I'm hunting in the same time and place as I have in the past? This need for information may be on the timescale of days to weeks and sometimes even hours. Academic scientists often have the support to conduct the research that collects observations or develops models that can provide the information that these other stakeholder groups need. However, each observation can only provide a glimpse at what's happening in a very small space over a very short period of time. And it's not until you collect many observations that you can begin to understand the broader system. Also, academic scientists support students and the results of research can take years to develop in some cases. Next slide, please. So recognizing these challenges, IARPIC Collaborations is hosting discussions on this topic to help individuals in each of these spheres identify opportunities for what we're calling win-win cooperation that provides benefits to each party. For example, resource management agencies may only have money to conduct one survey every year or once every two years, and they could benefit from more, more measurements. They might have money to pay a little bit to ask someone who's already near their area of interest to collect measurements, but they may not have the money to charter a vessel or pay their staff to spend a month at sea. Academic scientists may already have the funding to conduct basic science for a long-term monitoring program and could cooperate with agencies to collect some additional information that would better meet needs for applied science in return for some money to support some extra ship time. Folks working in academia would benefit because they'd have more days at sea, for example, and they'd increase their observations for the information that they find most interesting. Graduate students would receive training in collecting data that are relevant to meeting stakeholder needs and may develop skill sets and professional networks that could lead to job opportunities after graduation. 
Agency managers and academic scientists would benefit from cooperating with local observers in Alaska communities. These observers could provide rich context for observations that provide a sense of how an observation fits in the natural range of variability encountered over an observer's lifetime and over generations based on local and traditional knowledge. Alaska communities might find opportunities for win-win cooperation by receiving payment for their time and or compensation for things like fuel for their boat. Local observer networks can build capacity for conducting science in Alaska communities to move us toward greater opportunities for co-production of knowledge and indigenous-led science. Cooperating to collect the observations and developing relationships with scientists should mean faster access to scientific results and ideally direct involvement in the analysis and application of those results. Alaska communities might see greater benefit from the results of models than discrete observations if the models have the skill necessary to provide information reliably at spatial and time scales that are most relevant to communities. Cooperation with local observer networks may provide a means to collect the observations necessary to improve model skill in coastal areas. In all cases, the development of relationships with those in other spheres is important to, to achieving any of the goals that we've outlined today. This webinar is meant to provide an introduction to the topic. We plan to host a series of webinars in the coming months to focus on specific science questions. Most of the time during these follow-up webinars will be devoted to discussion in breakout group format to allow time for small groups of individuals to identify opportunities for win-win cooperation. Today, we'll hear presentations from two guest speakers who will help us introduce this topic. First, we'll hear from Bob Foy, Science and Research Director of the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center, who'll provide some thoughts from the perspective of a natural resource management agency. Then we'll hear from Alex Whiting, Environmental Program Director for the Native Village of Kotzebue, who'll share his thoughts on this topic from the perspective of an Alaska community. We've invited several people to join the audience today, many of whom have received funding for long-term monitoring programs like the Distributed Biological Observatory, among others, as well as modelers, some of whom are funded through programs like the DBO. We've allowed one and a half hours for our webinar today, and we hope that after the presentations from Bob and Alex, many of you will share your perspectives, including stories about successful cooperation and how those developed. The series is hosted by several collaboration teams and team leaders hope to hear some suggestions for science questions that we could use to focus future cross team webinars in this series. So if there's an interesting question that would get you excited about participating, please share your ideas. Now I'll turn it over to Bob Foy to present his thoughts from the perspective of a resource management agency. Bob is the science and research director for the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center. He joined uh, NOAA Fisheries in 2007 as the director of the center's Kodiak Laboratory and program manager for the Shellfish Assessment Program. Bob earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Michigan, a Master in Science in Fisheries, and a PhD in Oceanography from the University of Alaska. He spent over 25 years conducting marine biological and ecological research and 12 years working on stock assessment and fisheries management. Bob, thank you for joining us today to share your thoughts. The floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, can you hear me and see my first slide? Excellent, yes, we can. I see the nod. Great, thanks very much, Danielle. I appreciate that introduction. It's, it's um, good to hear where the group is going. This is a uh, very broad topic with a very broad audience. And uh, so my, you know, my focus for uh, 15 minutes here will be um, uh, very broad, um, you know, on what the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is working on. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion afterwards and future discussions on how we refine some of these discussions to topics that are win-wins. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of win-wins in my presentation. I have a couple of examples, um, but the goal is to put the information out there so that uh, this audience is aware of what we do at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and, and perhaps that sparks the right dialogue so that we can uh, get down to what those win-wins are. So thank you for that introduction and uh, the invitation to talk to this uh, joint group of, uh, of IARPIC. Um, as Danielle said, the, my goal um, ask of me today was to talk about research collaboration opportunities uh, with both academic uh, and community partners in the Arctic. So in the way of background here, oops, in the way of background, I don't use Zoom that much because I work for NOAA, so I'm moving my screen around. Okay, 
So in the way of background, uh, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is part of NOAA Fisheries, uh, one of uh, a number of science centers in, in different regions around the country. Our science center is responsible for the um, living marine resources within the Alaska EEZ, about a million and a half square nautical miles. We cover five large marine ecosystems. And, and why do I say that? I say that because the complexity in our region is immense. And uh, unfortunately, the amount of science being conducted in our region does not match that immensity. And as things change in our region, it's critical that we have these kinds of discussions to both share what our resources are. And as Danielle said, uh, the expense associated with what we do in Alaska uh, in the marine environment and terrestrial uh, is very large. So the more we can work the together, the better. And the more we see changes in this region, the more we need to uh, work with communities as well. So our main mission is stewardship of these marine resources. Uh, we have a focus on ecosystem-based fisheries management. Uh, that is something we continually strive for as we uh, manage the largest fisheries in the country, some of the largest in the world. There are two wings to the National Marine Fisheries Service in Alaska, three actually. There's, there's um, uh, the law enforcement part, there is the regulatory piece at the Alaska Regional Office, and then there is the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, uh, which I am the director of. So I will be focused on the science uh, specifically. That science is used to provide information to the management uh, of our commercial fisheries, as well as the conservation of our protected species, our marine mammals, uh, for instance. And as such, we've got a broader mission than just regulatory. We've got a broader mission that includes stewardship of marine resources and as such uh, allows us to uh, collaborate with some of our academic partners and our community partners um, more directly. So today um, I was asked to focus in on um, uh, observations, as Daniel mentioned. Uh, I'm also going to touch on uh, some process studies that take um, our need for science beyond just ob uh, observing into um, uh, mechanistic processes as we uh, experience climate change, as, as we ex experience other changes in the marine environment. And then lastly, focus on models. And I'm gonna talk about it in terms of prediction. Um, models are models. Uh, the, the point is what we're trying to do is provide some level of prediction and communicate what the uncertainty in that prediction is as we try to manage our living marine resources. And that's the hard part, is uh, communicating that uncertainty. So this slide here just shows where I believe as an agency person I need to start, and that is among agencies. Uh, NOAA, as you may know, has a number of different line offices. And I, I, the way I think about this is how do we leverage the data services from the various line offices within NOAA to define and, and move forward in terms of me completing my mission as an agency. My mission is in, in law uh, for the most part. Um, but then how do we then take that and identify gaps? and identify needs for our partners, um, be they academic, be they industry, be they community. Uh, so I think that coordination is critical and that's a place that I'm starting here. Um, on the right-hand side, I just uh, name a handful of issues that we have in the Arctic on the fisheries front where we're leveraging these data services. On the commercial fisheries front, um, again, I just, touched on a few very large topics here. Uh, northward migration of species. We had an increase of 5,000% uh, in one year of our pollock biomass in the north, uh, um, uh, northern Bering Sea, uh, southern Chukchi region, a handful of years ago associated with uh, the heat waves that we saw. 2,000% uh, increase in one year in the northern Bering Sea. These are dramatic numbers, uh, but the point is that these uh, species are moving. These ecosystems are changing as a result. Uh, some of uh, these fish have moved back um, to their more stable areas that we've seen in the last uh, 30 to 50 years. Uh, some are still up there. 
And uh, so that's a major issue for us. The economic value of these species, uh, it can't be lost in this conversation. This is important, not just to the people of this region, but to the people of this country. And I think that we can leverage that in terms of using uh, agency resources to um, uh, define what's important uh, for others in the region. The cultural value of these marine resources, again, I talked about economics for a moment. We can't just talk about economics. There's other valuation metrics that we must include in these conversations and are becoming more and more important as northern communities are impacted by these shifts in climate. Uh, crab fisheries conducted on the ice um, saw immediate failures in the last handful of years with the sea ice loss. Uh, shifts in the types of sea ice that we have available to us affecting marine mammal use. Uh, management of our stocks must now consider a broader area, approximately the size of California, uh, overnight. Uh, within one year, we had that added to our portfolio. Um, Arctic fisheries management plans uh, currently limit commercial fishing uh, north of the Straits. Um, however, we have commercial stocks moving into the, the Chukchi region. And then lastly, subsistence and communities are trying to adapt to climate change. How do we collect it, identify the information that's needed? How do we collect that information? How do we model that information and share it with each other? I'm gonna go kind of quickly through the next couple of slides here. Uh, they're only meant to show what we do in, in a large sense. And you can go back to the slides they are available online for any more details. Um, this is, uh, again, I was asked to discuss opportunities for collaboration. On the monitoring side, we do a lot of surveys. Uh, on the top, these are our assessment surveys. So this is where we're counting fish in particular here, either on the bottom trawl surveys on the upper left, uh, our acoustic midwater surveys in the middle, or our long line survey in um, off on the shelf edge. On the bottom, uh, some of our ecosystem surveys in, in and around the shelf region, around the Kodiak Archipelago, Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea in the center here, and uh, some of our process surveys in uh, the Chukchi Sea. Again, just to put some information out there and touch on and give you a, a flavor for the kind of footprint that the hundreds of people that work at the Alaska Fishery Science Center um, have in Alaskan waters each year. Um, and I could go on for hours about the potential opportunities for collaboration here, uh, but sharing this hopefully sparks some interest. Um, what kind of tools do we use to, to do these collections? We use uh, the large uh, NOAA vessels, which are oceanographic, uh, uh, large capacity research vessels. We charter commercial vessels. Um, that can also be used for uh, more than just fishing. Uh, we're using drone technology, we're using uh, AI and uh, other tools to identify species and, and assess them. Uh, this shows uh, some of our marine mammal uh, observing and monitoring portfolio. Uh, again, uh, various tools from ships to airplanes, uh, to hexacopters and remote drones, to even eDNA to identify uh, species and uh, species densities in Southeast Alaska. Um, this is again, just to give a flavor for the kinds of work that we do and for you to see the footprint in the massive footprint um, that we have in terms of, of collecting information that I uh, hope uh, sparks some interest in somebody to say, maybe we could work with them. Maybe we could be on the ship with them. Maybe we could co-collect data. A couple of examples here. Um, I'll start with the eco foci in the top. Uh, this is a, a, a long term relationship uh, between two line offices within NOAA in the Northwest region of uh, fisheries and uh, OAR, uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, and a number of years of collecting ocean and biological environmental data. And, you know, these all don't always get the focus within fisheries because these are the supporting data that help us better understand the environment. And the time has never been more important for these kinds of data. And, but unfortunately, with resources limited, with expanding missions into the Arctic, uh, it's harder and harder to do these kinds of investigations and support these kinds of investigations. So we, we need our partners 
We need to identify, uh, co-identify the needs for this kinds of information and extension of these 35 plus year time series. Uh, we're gonna need our academic partners. We're gonna need our local observations from the communities to continue to build on uh, what really is a legacy um, that um, it, it's hard to sustain right now. And it's gonna be harder to sustain. Um, I think there's a lot of people on from the DBO. I heard uh, Daniel say at the beginning, so I won't go into too much detail there, but this is another terrific example of uh, leadership being taken to identifying important uh, locations and a lot of hard work by a lot of people, um, uh, Jackie and, and her team, to make sure that every time we go through, we all try to work together to collect information. This is an excellent model. We need to triple this effort. We need to increase this effort on a number of different fronts so that we're all working towards similar goals um, as the, these shifts in, in the ecosystem uh, take place and uh, as we move to the Arctic. Uh, next couple of slides, I'm gonna show uh, just a couple of uh, collaborations on processes. And, and I added this to the ask uh, for this presentation because um, it can't be overstated how important it is that gap between basic data observation and what we're going to talk about next, these large scale uh, modeling uh, tools that are being developed. There's the need for data that helps us in the time frame of, you know, the next year to the next three years, uh, maybe two to five, maybe what's going to happen in the next season. And as we focus more and more on these larger models to better understand climate, we lose a bit of a foothold in these kinds of timeframes. And I, I think it's important that we acknowledge that the need to work with communities here. This is an example of an ice seal tagging project where um, there's a twofold need uh, to be working with coastal communities. One, the data collection itself. Um, working with people who know the ice, working with people who know the seals, um, identifying how and where and when is most appropriate to um, not only identify the questions, but um, put tags on animals. Secondly, to make sure that um, no harm is done in our effort to be good stewards of this environment with respect to those using the environment, uh, working with the native hunters to make sure that our, our research efforts are uh, not in conflict with the time or location uh, associated with the hunting. And then wrap it all together in true co-development by providing the information back to the communities to help inform them uh, about their, their resource. Second study here focused on cod tagging. Uh, this became critical for us during COVID when we couldn't go and do some of this work ourselves. Uh, this is a, a cod tagging project where we uh, did some of the tagging ourselves. We worked with people in uh, Savunga uh, to go out and capture cod. Uh, I want this job this next year uh, so I can go out and uh, capture cod off of Savunga and uh, put some tags on the cod. And, you know, it might seem kind of simple, but the importance of this level of data can't be understated. The information on the upper right here um, shows uh, the data, uh, shows the location for where the tags were put on the cod uh, up around St. Lawrence. I can't tell if you can see my arrow or not, but up around St. Lawrence. Um, great. Uh, the pinkish area here is sea ice and the dark blue boxes here, I think they're dark blue, uh, show the locations of those cod a handful of months later. Um, after the sea ice came in. And what you can see is movement of cod um, hundreds of miles uh, to the south and southwest from their original location, driven by ice, and in some cases, even moving to other uh, oceans. Um, huge amount of information that uh, Suzanne McDermott uh, put together that could not have been possible without collaboration, could not have been possible without uh, traditional knowledge, local knowledge, um, and is going to be hugely informative to the entire fishing industry, to fisheries management, to the communities, and it helps us all understand expectations moving forward. So again, example of collaboration and some of that mid-level work we collect, data we collect. Um, I'm going to go real quick through this one. Um, uh, just an example of the need for academic and international partnership. Uh, this just shows data, and you'll notice that it crosses 
uh, international lines. So these are data that are uh, shared uh, between our Russian colleagues and ourselves. Um, this is was used to inform a larger project looking at uh, pollock distribution and relating that back to environmental conditions in, in a cold and warm years. Uh, I put this here just to remind us that we need to work together to collect these data because, again, the area is vast, uh, the information is limited, and these stocks don't see lines. Um, these ecosystems don't see lines. So as our academic partners are working on one question, we need to um, maybe ask them to move a little to the right. And as our surveys are up on the right, we need to move a little to the left and uh, you know, again, work with our partners to collect information and um, uh, share. So prediction. Uh, so I was asked to, to talk about models a little bit. I'm just gonna touch on this. Um, models are important in terms of how we pull our data together. Um, but models range everything from a statistical correlation, you know, uh, model to a single species populations dynamics model, which is what we currently use to manage our fish stocks. Uh, we're trying to move towards multi-species models. And at the same time, in parallel to that, we're developing ecosystem models. Uh, ultimately, the end game and uh, an effort that is um, building steam right now with the current administration and uh, a number of partners working towards more climate informed models. So what do I mean by this? Um, it is difficult to address the complexity and it's mind boggling to try and communicate the amount of empirical data required to go from a single species model all the way to a climate informed model. However, um, we can't let that stop us. So while we continue to manage our stocks on single species in parallel, we are developing the framework for these climate informed models. These climate informed models take the perspective of the ecosystem, which includes people, the socioeconomics, uh, the downscaled climate models, the commercial fishing, uh, the community requirements for um, uh, uh, natural resources, marine mammals, et cetera. Uh, we build, uh, the intent is to build out uh, these um, larger uh, global models, these larger climate models to inform these processes. Um, we're looking 10, 20 plus years out. This is to tell us where we might be going. Again, we kind of skip over that two to five year um, time frame. Uh, but it's important that we do this to also inform the process and the kinds of information we can't let go of. And while these models are extremely important, they require information and data to feed, and it's critical that we work together to identify where those gaps are. So last couple slides here, uh, providing some uh, thoughts on collaboration. Um, again, this is a broad topic. Our footprint in Alaska is extremely broad. So I tried to put a few ideas here that I thought we could uh, chew on for the next hour um, in terms of uh, collaborating um, with the community. Number one, food security impacts. What are those impacts? We hear that there's likely food security impacts um, due to the environmental change, but what are they likely to be? How do we work together to identify what of those impacts we can do something about? What of those impacts we can inform? Uh, communities about, be it moving sea ice seals with, with the sea ice, or be it shifting uh, resources avail availability. Perhaps it's a good thing. Perhaps we see salmon um, show up in some of these northern communities where it hasn't before, and uh, working with communities to better understand how to um, secure some of those food resources. Uh, incorporating a traditional knowledge uh, identification of, uh, of research needs. How do we sit down at the same table and identify what research we should be working on to, to, um, to uh, better serve the communities? Citizen science, how do we identify how to do it, how to uh, provide uh, funding for it, uh, what data is valuable in that regard, and, um, and, and continue support. On the academic uh, front, um, the biggies, loss of sea ice, halves, um, responding to environmental shift that changes at a large scale. Um, a plea from me, I think often in the academic world, um, we look to the agencies and say, well, the agencies have a large uh, scale funding. Um, they provide ecosystem services um, directly uh, for the management of our living marine resources. 
I would say that those resources are actually pretty limited and uh, we need to work together towards a, a common goal. And, and, and I hope to, to convince some folks that uh, focusing on our living marine resources is also something that we need our academic partners on. Uh, innovative tools, uh, it can't be understated. We can't use the same old tools. There's not enough people, there's not enough ships. Um, so identifying what is possible um, with respect to different techniques and um, you know how valuable it is. We can't pendulum swing too far. We still need people, we still need to measure, we still need to collect biological data. Um, and then lastly, building partnerships to identify places we need to monitor. Um, I throw a few species here. Uh, I know I'm going a bit long, but um, a few species that I, you know perhaps we can talk about later. Uh, Pacific cod, uh, dramatically declining in the Gulf of Alaska due to heat waves, completely unexpected. Uh, shifting a thousand kilometers in the Bering Sea, unexpected. Sablefish, booming, huge year, year classes we haven't seen in, in decades um, concurrent with this, um, this uh, warming trend, unexpected. Herring biomass uh, recruitment event right now, statewide, unexpected. Arctic cod shifting back and forth um, in the Northern region, um, availability for the ecosystem unknown. Um, these are big topics that are dramatically affecting the ecosystem. So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. I I've got a couple of topics here that maybe we can come back to uh, to spark conversation if it's needed um, on uh, where we're going with a couple of these themes. And, and I could uh, describe those in a little more detail if we if we get there. Thanks so much, Bob. That was a really great presentation. It gives everybody a lot to think about. Thank you. I think what um, I'll suggest we do is rather than take questions now, since we have that big block of time for discussion after the two presentations is I'll suggest that we um, hear from Alex Whiting first and then um, come back to discussion that um, takes into account both the presentations from Bob and Alex. And in the meantime, <clears throat> we'll suggest that if you have questions uh, after hearing from Bob that you put them in the chat box. And then uh, once we get to the Q&A, we can, I will know, you know, have, have some people to start with to call on and that'll give Bob a few minutes to think about his answers too. <laughs> So, um, so now we'll hear from Alex Whiting. Alex developed the Native, of Vill Native Village of Kotzebue's environmental program in 1997, and he's directed the program since then. Much of the focus of the program has been on researching the physical environment and the ecology of Kotzebue Sound and integrating indigenous knowledge into scientific research projects. Over 120 tribal citizens have participated in some aspect of tribally led or cooperative research efforts. The environmental program is well known for developing community-based ice seal research projects, including being the first to successfully satellite tag bearded seals in Alaska. A cooperative multi-year effort to research the ecology of coastal lagoons and the relatively new phenomenon of cyanobacteria blooms is ongoing. Most recently, the environmental program helped lead the Ikagvik Sukukun project that researched the ice and ring seal denning habitat of northern Kotzebue Sound in a cooperative effort between scientists from Columbia University and UAF with research questions developed by an elders advisory council, which also directed the field research. Alex, thank you very much for joining us today to share your perspectives on this topic. The floor is yours. You're muted. How's that? Can you hear me? All right. I don't know sign language, so probably good I have sound. Um, so can you see my screen? Is my screen being shared? Uh, your screen is being shared. You might want to click the slide presentation mode. We can see your whole PowerPoint window right now. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. All right, so uh, today I'll talk a little bit about um, the kind of uh, topics that we're currently interested in and some examples of how we go about um, with successful collaboration. Um, I know it's the topics about dynamic modeling, but the 
issues that we're talking about are the kind of issues, some of which uh, may fall into that modeling program. Um, and since Bob spoke before me, I'd say that uh, we've been collaborating with NOAA for like the last 20 years. Uh, we um, not, not only do we assist them, but they assist us in, in um, one of the uh, approaches of our project is to develop our own capacity to really um, help lead research projects and to be uh, active co-partners and, and not just, you know, assist agencies, but have it the other way with agencies assist us. And in fact, uh, our Bearded Seal project that he spoke about at the time was uh, not only the first of its kind, but it also was providing um, the first uh, kinds of information uh, on movements and behavior that had ever been documented. And so there was a point early on when uh, Noah's website on Bearded Seals uh, basically had the Native Village of Kotzebue's program as the majority of the information listed there. And so, I mean, I just want to point that out because that was mm, probably a first, but it also was um, e exciting and um, showed the effectiveness of the tribes program when, you know, the federal agency is actually fronting our our project, our program, because that's the best available information out there. So uh, anyways, um, as far as the topics that uh, that we're interested in, they're, they're broad, but I'll go through some of those. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, the three main issues for medium and long range community planning efforts are permafrost stability, shoreline erosion, and sea level rise. Uh, ecologically, the kind of issues we are concerned with are the disappearing ice packs and implications for marine mammal habitat, ring seal pupping habitat in particular, and the changes in the system from ice al algae driven to phytoplankton driven um, systems and the winners and losers in that. Uh, that's sort of a broad concern for everyone I think that's interested in Arctic marine waters. Uh, the warmer waters are both the salt and the fresh are of interest for emerging new diseases uh, disease, let me, uh, for emerging new diseases, uh, disease range spread and overall increase in disease for birds, marine mammals, fish, marine invertebrates, and the related issue of increase in toxin loads, like demoic acid and saxotoxin. The, the impact of fish survival from eggs to spawning adults, we've also seen be become an issue with warming waters and seabird starvation events. Also, the observed increase in cyanobacteria and other harmful algae blooms are a concern and uh, changes that they can cause in dissolved oxygen and toxin loads. Uh, permafrost melting and related slump formations. Um, here you can see a picture of the Selic River slump area that uh, is occurring right above a um, prime sheafish spawning habitat. Uh, so far, there hasn't been much of an impact, but of course, as these kind of slumps uh, continue to form uh, from melting permafrost, they are a worry for us. Um, and the related issue of uh, increased nutrients in, in the waterways that can lead to uh, blooms, algae blooms. Uh, increasing air temperatures as it affects changes to caribou migration uh, due to later freeze up and earlier breakup, particularly as it relates to, to access to calving grounds uh, the increased mismatch in timing between caribou calving and spring green up also changes the insect presence as it relates to caribou spring summer cycles. The insects appear earlier and remain later, and then the related loss of snow relief uh, habitat. Uh, the snow fields where they can get away from insects are rapidly disappearing um, or not forming in the first place all of which can be critical to overall body condition and survivability indexes. Uh, currently, the most interesting and useful data for the largest number of local people uh, provided by the scientific community is the satellite imaging of ice conditions, being able to view and watch the development of ice conditions through daily satellite images, uh, lets local people understand changes in the ice pack occurring from year to year while 
provide a new real-time information to plan safe ice-based travel, ice fishing and seal hunting forays into the sound, especially around breakup uh, when boat hunting for root groups bearded seals occurs. And it allows hunters to maximize time and fuel spent and increase the success rate for hunting. And the best current example of developing models that I know of in responding to community needs is the multifaceted approach of the Alaska Ocean Observing System, Alaska Harmful Algae Bloom Network. Uh, this group is comprised of both a wide range of scientists and community members from Southeast Alaska to the Arctic and communicates regularly on a whole suite of toxic and issues from ocean acidification to PSP levels to developing models of the growth and spread of demoic acid and saxotoxin based on cruise collections of toxins, phytoplankton, zooplankton, clams, worms, fish, cis counts, and oceanography to quantifying Alexandrium and pseudonitrums. Uh, communities are collecting water samples for presence, absence of cells, uh, ocean acidification levels, and for some communities, they have a, a PSP monitoring system. Uh, while the PSP levels are for use in real time, these other collections are for developing models and tracking changes over time. For our program, we have tracked contaminant levels in fish and marine mammals as opportunities arise, and also track the emerging phenomenon of cyanobacteria blooms. While this information does inform consumption advisories when necessary, it is important to contribute to a broader understanding of the health of the ecosystem and resources and to monitor changes over time that may at some point be used to protect human health and provide context for any new consumption advisory. The context is one of the main important roles in engaging communities in ongoing research as it relates to the resources and environment on which they depend. Developing relationships and regular communication provides, provides to researchers a better understanding of the kinds and quantities of resources that communities harvest and allows for research to better target their focus to accommodate useful information while improving the community level understanding of you know, somewhat esoteric issues involved in contaminant and toxin models, for examples. It also, of course, informs what would constitute findings of significance that would need to be incorporated in the human health advisories, since these should be based on realistic consumption amounts. Uh, the most successful collaborations uh, have developed when researchers engage the community at the very early stages of research development. For example, the groundbreaking seal taking project we led was created by utilizing the indigenous knowledge of seal behavior, especially as it relates to timing and use of local areas, in addition to traditional capture techniques and the expert field work abilities honed through living off the land. This is combined with the scientific expertise of programming and fixing satellite tags, along with physiological sample techniques and proficient field project planning. The result was accomplishing a long time goal of the scientific community and significantly increasing knowledge of seal movements and behavior. This achievement was only possible by working together because neither group had all the necessary tools to do so alone. And, and that's again, where you elevate the contributions of the uh, indigenous participants, you know, beyond sort of field techs or manual labor or whatnot but actual co-equals when it comes to the intellectual strategies to uh, carrying out those efforts. Uh, more recently, we participated in the Narcovic Sikukun project, which Diana mentioned, Danielle mentioned, to study ice and ring seals. This project was the result of conversations that began between Annie Mahoney, a an ice researcher at UAF, and myself over a few years of discussing shared interest in understanding changes to ice conditions that have been noted to be occurring in Kotzebue Sound. While we had developed a cooperative community-based ice research project, we had no luck at getting funded after a couple of attempts, in part because there are so few dedicated programs for community-based research. So the research proposals that we do develop must be vetted through standard academic-oriented funding pots and the associated uh, scientific hypothesis reviewer critiques. While this is not necessarily a fatal flaw, it more often than not creates a handicap for a non-traditional cross-cultural approach to research. For example, the extremely successful bearded seal research project above was funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service through a newly created tribal wildlife grants program that was focused on funding tribal priority projects that were run through tribes, which incentivized the scientific community to seek out tribal partnerships in order to access research funds 
and made it more likely for non-conventional research approaches to get funded. However, a few years into our funding attempts, Andy was approached by another researcher, Chris Zappa at Columbia, um, who was interested in using UAVs to study ice. The Moore Foundation was interested in this UAV project, but wanted to see a strong indigenous community component. Because of the ongoing relationship Andy had with myself, we were able to quickly put together a project that was to be led by an indigenous elder advisory council who had developed the research questions to be pursued and lead many of the field efforts based on their extensive knowledge of local ice conditions. Oops, sorry. Uh, it is also important to note that the Moore Foundation was amenable to funding a project without the necessary upfront hypothesis that would be required of typical research funding. That is, the tribal elders would develop the research focus after the project began. They just needed to know we had all the necessary components in place to carry out a broad range of inquiry, which goes back to the point I was making earlier about non-conventional research funding like the TWG. From the tribe's perspective, we also did not have specific hypothesis, but had identified bearded seals as a high priority resource for the tribe and a need to know more about their movements and behavior. In fact, most of our most successful and noteworthy research efforts have had this approach, sort of the non-hypothesis approach. Uh, while the Kotsubi saw and the Kalak Sikukun project may have happened anyway, the ongoing relationship that had already been in place expedited the whole process. The approach of bringing together scientists their cutting edge technology led by indigenous ice experts resulted in a world-class research project with results that were exponentially more illuminating and informed had the community not been engaged or just engaged as field techs assisting in more narrowly focused predetermined scientific research. Uh, Arctic communities have the broadest interest in all things Arctic and thinking about discussing and understanding the social and physical Arctic environment is a daily undertaking within our communities and so anytime there is uh, interest in carrying out research in the Arctic of any type, uh, there's likely to be at least some interest within the community to, if not participate directly, to at least uh, share knowledge. Uh, so for those researchers that are working mostly offshore and not in the communities, they still need to think about uh, how they could provide the information they're collecting back to the communities. Uh, even like, for example, the DBO, even though I've been working on uh, working in this area of uh, the ecology of the Chuck you see in Kotzebue Sound and interested in things like uh, algae and nutrients and whatnot, I, I've had really no interaction with the DBO. Um, and I don't, off the top of my head, don't even remember seeing any of that kind of information that would likely be of interest to our program and our community. And so uh, for all those you know listening that do work in the Chuck you see or other areas that are offshore of the Alaska communities, um, it probably would be good to reflect on um, the kind of information you're uh, developing and whether some of that information uh, is, is getting out to the communities in a way that would be um, digestible and of interest to the communities. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that's really wonderful work you're doing. And I'm, I'm really excited that you've taken the time to join us today so that folks have a chance to talk with you about it. Thank you. So um, I think we already have a couple of questions here in the chat box from folks. Thank you. And I hope um, others of you will join in. I believe um, Rosemary uh, posted a question um, a few minutes ago. Rosemary, would you like to speak to your question? No, I'll just step in here and ask that Alex um, clicks the red stop share button. Um, oh, sorry. Yep, no worries. And for everyone, if um, it might be nice to go to the gallery view just so we can see each other. This is Rosemary and um, I'm very concerned about the way modeling is being done. I think that there are efforts that can help us, but when is it more appropriate to use modeling versus actual data? I feel that there could be some help in 
preparing to plan, but once a decision is being made, then we need the actual data and not the model to better inform the decisions. Uh, thank you. Would anyone like to respond to that? Danielle, I don't know if you're looking for a broader, broader interaction here, but I'd be glad to just respond briefly from a, a marine perspective. Um, uh, was that uh, Rosemary? Sorry, uh, Rosemary, thank you. Great question. Um, and couldn't agree with you more. And I think that this is um, highlights the need for the science community to uh, better communicate how good those models are when they are good versus when they're not good. Uh, the benefit of a model is that you can bring many different data sets together uh, to fill gaps and, and make some predictions. But as you've stated, as, as policy decisions are made on these models, the farther you go away from the data, the more uncertain they are. So I, I think identifying which models are good, where the gaps are and how they should be used uh, is an excellent um, comment on, on how we move forward with using them for, for policy and decision making. Thanks, Bob. Um, Kathy Kuhn, I believe you had a question that you posed in the chat box. Would you like to speak to it? Yes, I would. I, I guess uh, the question is uh, to Alex or any anybody else on the line, and, and that is how could researchers do better at listening to issues that communities have, questions that might help focus scientific efforts or the ways that we could better present the information that seems more relevant to topics. Did you want me to say something? Um, so, so one, uh, the first part of your question, I think that it, uh, it just takes uh, a little more imagination on the researcher's part to uh, understand uh, the potential uh, assistance and or benefits they could get from, you know, uh, working with local communities. And not, not so much, well, I mean, sort of out of a sense of responsibility, but also just understanding from an intellectual perspective, um, the depth and richness that could be um, brought into play in the context that could be brought into play with whatever particular subject that you're working on. You know, unless it's like something extremely esoteric, uh, it's likely that the community has um, very useful contributions to make. Um, and then the, the second part of your question is, um, a little bit tougher, but that also um, only because it's only tougher because it helps to develop uh, a dialogue with um, somebody in the community uh, uh, in a liaison type of role, or at least somebody that can help you um, vet your results in a way that's easily digestible. Um, I mean, we, we always try to create so we always try to get, you know, papers published on the research that we're doing, of course. Um, but we also, uh, that doesn't really do anything for the community because most people in the communities don't sit around reading scientific journals, uh, believe it or not. And so we have to uh, make sure that we think outside of the box um, when we're producing, uh, when we're uh, creating ways to illustrate those results. Like you could see in uh, my presentation, I had that one snapshot of um, the movements of ring seals um, in the Barren and Chukchi seas. Um, well, while, while, you know, spaghetti maps are not new, the reason that we came up with the animated version of the movements along with the ice and, and whatnot is in, in part because I was making sure that we could present the results in a way that was um, user-friendly, sort of aesthetically pleasing and engaging with the audience. Uh, the same with like contaminants, you know, of course, contaminants can be a really dry 
issue the results of looking at, say, the contaminants in seals, for instance. Um, but I made sure that we presented those results in a food label format, something that most people are familiar with and every time they buy something at the store. And so that's what I mean by thinking outside of the box is, is you know, you, you need sort of a, 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 a common denominator presentation, right? Like, or, or some way to present results that's not sort of dry and, and just really data heavy, but that turns those results into something that's easily digestible for your average person on the street. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, Lauren entered a comment in the chat box. Lauren, I wonder if you'd like to um, speak to it. Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thanks. And I apologize. I, I joined the conversation a little bit late um, for some other meetings, but I, I caught Alex's um, presentation and it really, uh, struck me that um, the DBO, which is something that I consider one of the programs that is more well-known and well-established and um, has a, a pretty broad uh, understanding in the region is, is maybe not um, as, as um, known to, to all of our villages and all of our communities. And I, I noticed Jackie um, added some questions there that I, I would love to hear some answers and thoughts to, but um, I was thinking of Rosemary's concern for modeling. And I was just on a conversation this morning with regards to co-management of marine mammals where uh, we are using locally derived data that we've been collecting to help ground truth some modeling work that um, the Fishery Science Center has been doing with regards to Northern fur seals. And I think it's super important that we do continue to uh, advance the conversation where, you know, this type of relationship building and, and pushing the types of projects that Alex spoke about, where you have co-equal partners in communities, you have something beyond local research assistance or um, labor uh, positions in the communities, but that we're really bringing together different types of information and knowledge with science and ground truthing, the modeling work that's going on, um, expanding the the kind of single discipline science that's um, kind of checks all the boxes for traditional funding sources, but um, this more equitable and, and community plus traditional research partnership is, is really more helpful to communities on the ground and to addressing the, the real issues um, that we're all trying to address together in, in reality. And so I'm, uh, this is a great, great conversation. And I think, um, I just wanted to, to add those thoughts to both Rosemary's concerns, but also um, Alex's great presentation. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, that's a, a really um, important conversation. And um, I think I'm, I'm excited that we have so many IRPIC teams engaging in this conversation. And I've already had um, some outreach from the, the modeling group on, you know, let's let's work together on this. Let's continue to um, use opportunities for coordination among our groups to improve the models we're, we're developing. Um, and I think we've talked about the fact that there, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, improve understanding in nearshore areas where often some of the models may do okay offshore, but once you start getting close to the coast and you have those interactions with um, inputs from the terrestrial system, you, it gets a lot more messy and it gets harder to collect the data that you need to improve those models. And I think there's a really wonderful opportunity to cooperate with uh, coastal communities to help collect the observations necessary to improve those models. And if we can develop models that are more reliable at um, predicting conditions near communities, then those models might be more useful for addressing community concerns. So um, I'm excited that that we're beginning to engage in this conversation and that so many of you are interested in, in contributing. So thank you. And um, Yvette Spitz um, put a comment in the chat box um, along these lines as well is that um, you know, just discrete observations in one space and time um, without the benefit of putting them into models could be just as as difficult to use because as many of you who are on the line know, um, you could 
take a measurement in the ocean. And if you wait six hours and take it again, you might find something really different. Um, so um, Jackie um, Grebmeyer, I believe you had a, a comment uh, in the chat box. Would you like to speak to it? Sure, I do. Um, uh, Alex, I appreciate your comments. And I guess what you have to, the question I have for you and, and just in general is that we have done outreach to the communities have, you know, we were out on Savunga last year before COVID hit had meetings in, uh, in Nome and have had meetings in Utiavik and but not every village. So I guess the bet, maybe your advice and uh, suggestions on how to bring the on the ground dialogue more to all the villages. I mean, one of the things I would say we're doing with uh, Hio Icon and the new coordination is try to connect the DBO into the near shore zone and onto the land that has the most connection, I think with the community uh, as far as uh, near shore measurements like harmful algal blooms we do those offshore. We look at the nutrients that drive the prey that are important for the bigger animals that are most important, I think, to the community and where the fish are going. So, I mean, I think that uh, how the best to build, my question is how to best to build that dialogue more that all the villages would know what the DBO is doing, although it's offshore in a big ship, we are trying to make it closer and maybe develop a way to do co-production near shore. And so any, any advice you have on that or input would be greatly appreciated. And well done on the talk. Thank you. Yo, I'm neat. Um, so I think, I mean, it is a challenge, of course. Um, uh, so, so in those cases, though, when you have sort of an ongoing project and um, maybe even a kind of a big project that produces a lot of kinds of data that may or may not be, you know, any particular area may or may not be of interest or even understandable to the average person in the communities is to um, think about uh, maybe a, a couple of points along the trajectory of data collection uh, and time, depending on, you know, um, like with the DBO, which may be an ongoing concern, you know, year after year for so many years. Uh, I'm sure there is, there is, a couple of points in time where you could collate um, the, uh, all the different uh, points and create some uh, overall sort of uh, point in time that it makes sense to um, uh, display, you know, the results and the implications um, and uh, have some budget set aside for sending out to box holders or at least uh, a handful of community um, players, you know, like tribes and city governments um, and, and other, a handful of other kind of community contacts in the villages to get that information displayed um, and at least uh, try to hit the major regional centers, um, you know, which, which I guess it sounds like you guys are in a couple anyways, um, but, uh, and then places like, you know, the Sea Grant office in Nome, and then like myself here in Kotzebue, um, or the Northwest Arc Borough for the region. Um, so just there's ways to go about it where you're not, um, you know, trying to think about how you give talks or how you um, send out information constantly, but to uh, imagine if yourself was a community member and where those points in time may be and how that information may be able to be um, conveyed in a way that's that's of interest. So, I mean, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my thoughts about oh, that. That is helpful. Thanks, Alex. Hi, you put some comments in the chat box. Would you like to speak to them? Uh, well, I thanks. I, this, this is a great conversation. I appreciate um, the presentations in particular. I, all I wanted to say is, you know, it may not always be appropriate, but spending more time, I mean, part of the challenge is that uh, is, is a lack of time. So creating a space and a time where researchers, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, it's only the students who have the time, can spend time in a community and learn with local experts on issues that matter to them in a way that is controlled by the community is maybe a good way to approach the question of what research matters. You know, and the example I, I try to give is, and it, it relates to the photo in the background was taken by Billy Adams, a Nupiak ice expert from Utkiavik. Um, you know, if, if you're up there, 
that there's always need for people to help with trail building, you know, through CS pressure, pressure ridges like this. And, and doing that um, is something that is, is appropriate if you're asked to help and doing it for, for several days or even over the course of the weeks can really change your thinking and, and focus on issues that matter to the community. And in that context, I also want to highlight uh, what, what I refer to as super users of information. There's a number of people like the Nukiavik. Uh, I also highlighted Kurt, Curtis Merpuk from Shishmaref who have a, a much more sophisticated understanding, frankly, than somebody like myself uh, in terms of what satellite data or what observational data are actually meaningful and relevant to a community and, and who then are asking very specific and very constructive questions about, well, how can this be improved or how can we get better access to the data or how can we collaborate on creating new knowledge out of these tools that people in, in communities are using in a very sophisticated fashion. The one other comment that I just want to append is that, of course, great, uh, um, a great approach to, to get at this question of what, what are important questions is to involve K through 12 students from the community, because oftentimes they have a much, again, a much better understanding than, than a lot of us that come into the community. And I, I want to highlight in particular some of the work that Katie Spellman and Elena Sparrow have done with students in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, where the students themselves have come up with climate change adaptation measures that the community is, is supportive of that, that in my mind are, are, are much more sophisticated again than, and, and more effective than, than what you might cook up in, in the solitude of your office. So uh, thanks. And sorry, I, 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 okay, I can't resist because I, I did wanna, I, I saw Lauren comment. I don't wanna uh, uh, loop back to something that Lauren brought up, Lauren Devine brought up in a meeting that I was part of that really helped me as well. And that is uh, related to the question of models. And maybe Lauren, you can talk more about it. The use of conceptual models may be a better way to find common ground between the, the concerns that Rosemary uh, voiced earlier. Because one of the challenges that I see is that, you know, this reductionist approach that say I would take as a glaciologist trying to isolate just a, a tiny little sliver of a problem that I, I feel, yes, I, I can solve this, you know, and it, I completely lose track of the big picture. Um, that, that, that in model design, sort of in classic model design is a problem, but if you start with a conceptual model, I, I think it, it may be a much more, a much more productive approach. Thanks. Lauren, did you want to speak to Hayo's point at all? I can, but I won't pretend to be an expert on uh, conceptual modeling. However, in the you know, more interdisciplinary groups that I've, I find um, our, so I, for those that don't know me, um, I work for a tribal government in the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea. And so working for a tribal government um, for an environmental department, we're of course interested in how we can better collaborate and extend our network for research and monitoring through um, agency partnering, uh, academia uh, partners. And as we try to address some of these disparities between, um, you know, the gaps of Western science applied for decision making versus how to include local and traditional knowledge or or different types of data uh, that may be considered more anecdotal or less, um, you know, hard data, quantitative um, information that's traditionally been kind of what we've based uh, decisions on how we can come together and, and um, reimagine some of these issues together across uh, very different worldviews, very different disciplines uh, and, and um, processes. And this idea of conceptual models is something that we're looking more towards as it gives everyone collectively a place to come together, uh, establish a, a starting point um, and bring in the types of information uh, and data and kind of create a new process that outlines and structures uh, a way to look at the issue from various uh, points of view or um, backgrounds and, and come together collectively around these issues in kind of a, a reimagined way. And I'm, I'm hopeful that it will um, be, you know, a, a type of process that is attractive to some of our funding agencies um, as we start to explore explore this through broader and uh, maybe more diverse partnerships. Thanks, Lauren. So um, 
What, what I think the IARPIC team leaders plan to do to focus future webinars that'll follow up on this introduction is to identify some science questions that teams of a few collaboration uh, teams would um, focus on, where we would bring the members of those teams together um, and hopefully involve folks from the three different spheres that I discussed earlier, resource management agencies, academia, and Alaska communities, and um, break out into small groups of three or four people and, um, you know, with a representative from each of those spheres and say, you know, what's your win-win? Go have a conversation about, with respect to this science question, what might a win-win opportunity for cooperation look like to give people a starting point um, to build from? So um, what I'd like to maybe think about during the rest of this webinar is um, what might some of those questions be? I think rather than saying, let's focus on DBO specifically as a science program and what are the opportunities, I think we might get more engagement from people who are interested if we can pose an interesting science question that someone's interested in looking at. Um, so what might some of those science questions be? And I'll invite, anyone on the webinar to speak up. Um, and I know, Bob, you mentioned that you had a few examples from your experiences um, with fish in particular. Um, and so if you would like to maybe um, highlight one of those examples, um, I think it might be interesting to learn from, you know, there've been, you mentioned Pacific cod in the Gulf of Alaska, um, some species that are in the vicinity of DBO. Can we look at examples where we had monitoring programs um, going um, and then we still had some of those unexpected shifts in species. You mentioned the word unexpected several times as you highlighted those examples of Pacific cod and sablefish and Arctic cod. Where did we miss opportunities where we had data and we were still caught off guard? And what might we learn from those to help kind of frame some of those science questions that we get people engaged in going forward? Thanks. Yeah, Danielle, I, I think you were directing that question towards me to kind of go um, identify one of these projects. Um, if I may, let me take one quick step back. Um, and uh, just expand a bit on where Ohio was going and, and still answer your question here. Um, I, I think that a key is to set up a framework for this kind of a dialogue is to do what you've done here, is to put a question out there or a topic or a concern, but to, to make sure that everybody in the room is aware that what we're trying to do is build a relationship. And someone might put a question out there that is not of interest to you. So you might go into a community or into an academics office and you might have a need where you just need some information from them. And that's okay. You know, we should open up those conversations and vice versa. Someone might come to, you know, I'm a regulatory agency. Someone might come to me and say, I need some information. My first response might be, Sorry, that's another department. Um, it shouldn't be because we're trying to build a relationship. And in, in between is identifying these topics where we really have the need for co-development, where there is something that I'm up there working on, for instance, and now I'll get to where, where you were trying to get me to go, uh, questions about, let's say, Arctic cod. Uh, Arctic cod are a critical ecosystem component uh, in the Arctic, a number of different species. Uh, we know that as it uh, cools down, those Arctic cod make their way down in, into the Southern Bering Sea. Uh, and we see them in our Southeastern Bering Sea surveys. Uh, as it uh, warms up, we see those that distribution shrink back to the north. And you know, our goal is to try and determine how important those Arctic cod are to the ecosystem. Uh, the same could be said for herring. Herring is a critical forage component of the Bering Sea ecosystem. Uh, herring distribution shifts uh, based on temperatures. It shifts based on your class strength. So, I, you know, that's something that we observe. But from an agency perspective, by the time we get to the question of what was the impact of this recruitment event, it's too late. It's gone. They're adults. We're fishing them. So working with our communities, working with our academic partners 
in this middle ground to expand on something that we're looking at over a long-term time scale to again, take that step back to the two to five year time scale and say, what is the impact of that event right now on the ecosystem? Um, th there's, there's one example. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, the, the example that we all talk about is that code, true co-development, where we start from scratch, there's a gap in knowledge, and we try to write the hypothesis or write the question or identify the conceptual model. It's a great idea, Lauren, and identify, you know, what we want to do together. And I think we just have to take that step back and acknowledge that it's that full distribution of relationship building that we're trying to do here. Um, it's not all or nothing. Hopefully the Arctic Cod example uh, got you in the direction you were looking to go. Thanks, Bob. Would anyone else like to add to the discussion? Uh, I would. Go ahead. I think the comments that are circulating about models and short-term and long-term are exactly the, the framework to build common interests. Um, and a question to consider is two end members. One is a decision and where questions are. And may, my, my, my activities in this area with training a number of foreign ministries, a diplomatic corps of foreign ministries involves informed decisions, which are defined as operating across a continuum of urgencies, short term to long term. And in that sense, the starting point are questions. Questions of common concern among allies and adversaries alike reveal the methods, whether they're natural science, social science, or indigenous knowledge methods to define the, to derive the data to answer the questions. Those are stages of research, which we're all involved with, questions and generation of data with methods. Data, however, are not evidence. Evidence involves the institutions that make decisions. And so evidence in itself is insufficient for making the decisions. Options that allow the decision makers to make choices are involved as well. Evidence and options are actions. And I think this discussion is considering the process from questions to informed decisions with a variety of observing systems in a, in a generic sense, as well as specific to specific questions. But there's a process. And I think that the, the real challenge in this and the value of the scientific community is that we understand time. We, we look at time, we think about things over short and long time scales, the past, the present, and the future. And the decision-making, if it only operates at one point in time, isn't informed. And we can see that in the world today, for example, the United States in pulling out of the World Health Organization was an uninformed decision because it only operated at a single point in time. And the value of models and observations in terms of I'm just trying to share as best I can experience that operates across many governments, that the opportunity is to think across time and to interact the stage of questions with the decision makers, to frame the questions of common concern among allies and adversaries alike, to build common interests in ways that, that enable sustainable solutions, resilience and capacity. So I, I express my passion and I like to be helpful in this discussion. Thank you. Alex, since you're one of our speakers, I see you put a, a comment in the chat box. Would you like to, to speak to the Arctic Cod question? No, I mean, I, I, was, I was just reading the comments and I noticed that Libby had asked about Arctic Cod and time and space. And uh, I was just, Saying that a space-time model would be nice, but last I heard, we have no idea where the young of the year for one-year-olds, et cetera, the young Arctic cod are at, at least that's the last I've known is we're missing. We, we know where they 
are at when they're adults, and I think we might even know where they're at when they're spawning, but we don't know where the the young are rearing up at. At least last I heard. So I was just mentioning that. But it would be nice to have a model of that. So Danielle, sorry, but to to uh, Paul's point. Um, and Alex's point, building on what Libby was saying, um, spot on. We, we, we have a common question. Uh, we have we have identified a gap in knowledge and the potential, um, you know, we still don't know how important this is. Uh, I would add to the discussion on the Arctic cod life cycle, a life cycle um, potentially a conceptual model there and in, in where they are spa in space and time, but how important are they? Are, are we looking in marine mammal stomachs and look, looking in the right diet sets to say when and how they're important? Um, what is the value of these ephemeral movement patterns to an ecosystem? Uh, as we know, many species depend on single year classes to be hugely successful for decades um, and or uh, single feeding events in a season or a particular season that's important to them. So how important are Arctic cod? Um, anyway, just highlighting that it, there is a gap of, in knowledge, a gap in understanding, and I think there's a, a distribution of information here from local information on, on, on when we're seeing these fish, um, when we may be seeing them interacting with seabirds and or uh, marine mammals, and then a, you know, a broader scientific question that requires a big ship in a net, but um, you know, that, a full range of, of questions that perhaps brings a community together. Yeah. I guess that reminded me like about 10 years ago, I had G. Price down there in Juneau at NOAA. Um, he actually, we collaborated with him and uh, we surveyed with local people in Augers, we surveyed like 200 miles of coastline in the wintertime trying to find Arctic cods in the wintertime. So you're, you're, you're chiming in on that. I had forgotten about that, but you're chiming in reminding me of that. And so that's like you said, there's wherever there's opportunities to answer those broader questions that can't be totally answered by a ship cruise out in the middle of the Chuck cheese. And I mean, of course, we, we, we weren't very successful. Well, I guess we were successful in understanding where Arctic cod were not. So I guess in that sense, you know, anytime you do science, you're always successful. It's just you're not necessarily successful at answering the question that you sent out to answer. So I would, we did, we did move forward knowledge of Arctic cod. It was just different knowledge than we were looking for. Yeah, and I think this is, provides a really nice example of, of another opportunity. And I have a question to pose and I hope Donna Hauser and Lauren are still on the line because I, I think they, they might be able to help us a little bit. You know, one example, uh, opportunity might be to work with local observer networks to um, have folks try to collect some more samples um, throughout the year that might help us get a better sense of where are Arctic cod when they're spawning and where are those little guys and maybe uh, even you know having observers on the ice drill a hole and put a minnow trap on underneath the ice and see what they catch at various times a year might give us some more information even if it's just the the they're not their information um and and at the same time could they could be collecting all kinds of useful information that folks on the sea ice team and others would find um, really valuable but i think one one question i have is you know it's it's obvious where there's opportunities to work with local environmental observers who are interested in this when they're engaged in collecting observations there's mechanisms through those observer networks to pay people for their time um, to compensate them but what are the opportunities to um, use those local environmental observer networks to pay people to engage in the lead up process to that, that process of ident identifying questions, building relationships, um, doing that co-production of knowledge piece where they're not actually out in the field dropping a net. Um, do those observer networks now provide a mechanism to pay people for that sort of time for engagement? And if not, you know, how might we think outside the box about ways to do that? I could take a stab at that, but I would let Donna, I, you just unmute it if you want to go first. <laughs> um, okay, sure. So 
So hi, everybody. I'm Donna Hauser from UAF, the International Arctic Research Center. And I lead um, an environmental observing network called the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. So we work with observers um, from Kotzebue to Koktovik, and including in partnership with people like Alex Whiting. Um, so you raise a lot of really interesting questions there, Danielle. Um, let's see. Starting maybe with that space of like, how do we create, how do we do co-production? How do we create the space to start identifying the question? So it is, it's one thing where, you know, in the Arctic cod example, say there's a, some scientists who are really interested in getting samples or doing mon monitoring of Arctic cod. Um, it's not necessarily a straightforward path to just saying to our AOK -okay observers, like, okay, let's start doing this. Um, there needs to be some relationship building and partnership about those research questions. And often it occurs, in our case, it's it's often happening in like, maybe it works in one community, but not in every AOK -okay community. Um, and so I would say that there needs to be resources and time developed, um, not just for the scientists, but also for the people in the communities that they want to connect with. Um, to pay them, like you say, um, to create the spaces to actually have those conversations before we just sort of dive in and say, this, these are the questions that we're going to be addressing. We know that there's research or that there's observers out there. Um, let's just sort of leverage that opportunity. It, it needs to be more than just, just, just that sort of like starting there. So Lauren, I don't know if you want to build on that. Absolutely. And I think there was a lot packed into what you said, Danielle, that was um, great. And yeah, thank you to, to build off of Donna's answer. So first, I do think it, it's important, even at pres presence absence, information has been very important for us, especially in building like long term and baseline data. Zeros are data too. So to know what's, what's absent is um, important as well as just looking at, you know, things in the environment that at, when they're present. The question of existing programs versus new programs is what um, really raises to, to the top of my mind. And so there are um, networks in place. I, I'm part of one, Donna's part of one. Um, there are some great efforts going on around our state and internationally uh, to have existing uh, people and capacity and resources in place to be able to leverage to collect data. However, it, it is really important that um, you know, we need to be looking towards the value of um, and changing the process that allows some funding to go towards establishing uh, various positions in more communities to increase the breadth of, of data collection. We in St. Paul have a lot of um, surveys and data collection efforts that we're part of. We participate in citizen science and um, more rigorous uh, scientific programming type things, but not, you know, not every community has that. And I think we really do need to focus on um, more local level uh, observer positions and, and finding ways to fund that. The important piece is I think there are some good mechanisms in place that pay people to do the research and planning. I think we do see a little bit more um, of that type of funding and more efforts, um, at least in, in my experience, like having more conversations around, um, could we apply for this grant to work out the structure or this planning and, and research um, how to set up a program idea. But I, I think um, certainly we do need to look towards flexibility in funding both the planning side of things because observers may not be the ones that are at the table in planning the framework of implementing the monitoring, but they might be the ones on the ground then that you would pay to collect the data. So it might not always be the same people, um, but I do think that we are building and strengthening our networks, uh, at least through indigenous organizations in the state to um, address issues of capacity and turnover and networking so that we're strengthening and supporting each other in um, best practices, lessons learned, uh, how to connect who with who, and just improving the communication and, and relationship building from that side of things. But Daniel, I think you're you're right. There's 
there's that effort um, that needs to happen that really pays attention to the people in the room that are doing the planning and the, and the structuring and setting up the process and, and addressing the research questions or establishing the research questions. And then you have, um, how can we strengthen and expand the number of people on the ground or the number of communities we can involve in on the ground data collection uh, for, for some of these really important issues that we're, we're all interested in. Could I just add one more thing? Um, as Lauren was talking, she, she she made me think of you know with with the um, the AOK program. That's our acronym. Um, you know some of the observations. This was started with the seasonal ice zone observing network that Hayo Iken started, in, you know, in, in two thousand eight. So we have some observers like Joe Levitt and Utjagvik who you know been providing observations for a long time. And I actually think that one of the things that we could, we could, one place we could start that would be really interesting is to really start thinking about the questions we already could maybe could address with the information we've collected. Um, and, you know, we've identified here, there's been some interesting uh, questions that have come up. And I think that maybe thinking a little bit more about other questions that we know might be interest in, of interest to people and communities and to our observers and also to scientists and start trying to do some demonstrations of the kinds of partnerships and research questions we could address. It'd be really interesting. Absolutely. Well, I, I wanna be respectful of people's time. We're already past the 11.30. Um, point. So I'm, I am thrilled that we had so much wonderful um, dialogue. Um, and I, I wish we had more time, but I'm encouraged that we'll have those future webinar opportunities that will follow up on this one to really dive in um, to, to some of this a bit more. Um, so I want to uh, really thank Bob and Alex um, for um, spending the time to, to give their presentations and talk with us. I want to really thank all of the wonderful folks who've participated and, and added your voices to the discussion. And I'd really like to thank the other IARPIC team leaders who've um, helped design and pull this together. And for all of, thank you in advance for all the work you're going to do in the coming months to follow up on this, I hope. so. Um, I want to um, allow an opportunity for any of the other IARPIC team leaders to, um, to add to the conversation um, before we wrap up. And then I'd also like to mention that um, IARPIC posts all of the recordings of our webinars on the IARPIC Collaborations site. And if you aren't already a member, please go to IARPICcollaborations.org and request to, um, to join and become a member of the team that's team or teams that are most relevant to your interests. And you can access the um, event page for this webinar. And if you look at that page, there's a comments box. And we um, strongly encourage all of you to add comments to the comment string on the event page. And all the team leaders, as we begin working to develop the follow-up webinars, will refer to those comments for ideas on what are some of those science questions that would be most interesting to, uh, to move this, this conversation forward. So. Um, uh, thank you for all to all of you for participating and uh, I'd like to ask if any of the other um, team leaders would like to to say something before we wrap up. Thanks so much. Um, this is Molly McCammon with the Environmental Intelligence Collaboration Team. Thanks so much, Danielle, um, and to Bob Foy and to Alex for your presentations and for the great discussion. I think this is um, really a um, I think Alaska actually is on the cutting edge of these kinds of discussions. Um, I'm hearing them all around the country um, in other regions of the US and of the Arctic and of the globe. So we really have the opportunity to show how to make this happen and do a better job of integrating and, and making the outcomes more usable for those who use our marine environment. So thanks very much for hosting this. All right. Well, with that, we'll end this webinar. Thanks again to everyone for your participation. And we look forward to, uh, to talking more as this uh, series continues. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Stay healthy. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Thank Danielle. you all. Bye, everybody. Yeah.